Well, I second Denise. Thank you guys so much for coming out tonight. I really appreciate you all being here. Um, I will talk, like she said, a little bit about the science of saving endangered species. That's what we do at the Endangered Wolf Center. Um, I work there as their director of animal care and conservation. So my job is to make sure that our animals on site are healthy and happy and doing great. And then I also work off site and actually get some of our animals back out into the wild. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit tonight about what we do. I'm going to tell, talk to you first, though, about um, just a little bit of our history of our center. So as Denise said, our job is to save endangered species of canids. Has anybody heard the word canid before? Yeah, what's that mean? Canine, canine yeah. Can you guys think of anybody else in the canid family? Oh I was going to say, most of you probably have some at home, right? <laughs> Who knew that your dog was in the same family as a wolf? What else? Bears, mm, they're in the carnivore. You're close. They like meat too, right? But they're not related to canids. Can you guys think of anything that's cute and little and sly? Yep, foxes. Coyotes, um, jackals in, in Africa. There's a lot of different animals that are in that canid family. So if you guys see something that's kind of dog or fox-like or wolf-like, that's probably a canid. And that's what we specialize in. And we do that through education, research, and then reintroducing a lot of the species that we work with back out into the wild. Who knows who Marlon Perkins is? The, the cool old guys know who he is. <laughs> How many of you guys know who hmm, Steve Irwin, the crocodile hunter, is? Oh, what? Um, Jeff Corwin? I see a couple of the younger kids aren't knowing who he is. All right, so Marlon Perkins is the original crocodile hunter. He used to be on Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom TV show. So he was the guy who went all around the world into crazy situations, seeing all sorts of awesome animals and bringing that into your living room through the television in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. Well, he also used to be the director of the St. Louis Zoo. So he's a pretty cool guy. Um, when he retired, he started our center in 1971. And the reason why is of all those cool animals that he saw, the one that stood out to him the most as being important for the ecosystem, being um, completely misunderstood, and being eliminated from our landscape was the wolf. And he knew, he and his wife Carol knew that they needed to do something to save wolves. And so they started the Endangered Wolf Center. And so, like I said, we were found in 1971, and our job is to make sure that endangered species of, of animals, their gene pools stay healthy, and we'll talk about why in a little bit, that we work with animals in a way that they'll survive out in the wild, so we don't habituate them to people, we don't pet them, we don't talk to them, we don't hand feed them, we let them be as wild as possible, so when they go into the wild, they do well. Um, and then we work with a lot of different organizations to get animals back out into the wild. And because of Marlon and Carol's foresight, he has been able to help save three species from extinction. The Mexican wolf, the red wolf, and the swift fox. And I can tell you the Mexican wolf and the red wolf probably wouldn't be here today without their foresight. And that happened in our own backyard. As a St. Louis, and I never even knew about the Endangered Wolf Center until I was in college. We are one of St. Louis's best kept secrets. But I can tell you as a nonprofit, it's not awesome to be a secret. We don't want that. We don't want people to know that we're out there and we're doing awesome stuff. But as a St. Louis, and I'm really proud of what we're doing in our own backyard. So these are the species that we work with mostly. As you can see, the top two, they are critically endangered. Who can tell me what endangered means? Some of the smaller guys. Yeah. They're almost gone, right? Very good. So could you imagine only having 130 or 40 animals left in the entire wild of population? That's what's going on with the Mexican wolf and the red wolf. So they are our priority for conservation. We also work with the Maine wolf and the Afri African painted dogs. Now 5,000 next to 40 and 130 seems like a lot, right? You're like, well, how is that endangered? Well, of those 5,000 African painted dogs and Maine wolves, you're looking at the entire continent of Africa and South America that those 5,000 are in, and they're segregated into tiny little 
populations now that can't get to each other. It used to be in the hundreds of thousands. So when you put it in that perspective, wow, they're way down and they're still declining. And swift foxes, we know that their populations um, are going up, but they're actually working on a survey right now to figure out how many are left in the wild. Um, and they're actually native to central um, United States, from Canada down to Texas. And then the phonic fox is from the Sahara Desert. That's the little guy at the bottom. That's Daisy, she's cutie. Um, and you guys can see her, she's at the center. So if you guys wanna come meet her, you can. Um, their population's declining, but because it's in the Sahara Desert, nobody wants to go study them. It's hot, it's hard to get around there. So we don't know exactly what is going on with their population. And that's kind of a scary place to be in. But before we go too much further, why do all this work? Why have a center that is so focused on canids and wolves? What, why are they cool? Because they are cool. <laughs> well, carnivores, as we've learned in just the recent, last few recent years, are extremely important to making sure that the ecosystem, the trees, the birds, and all the animals stay healthy and diverse. That's Carolita, she's one of my favorite girls. She's a Mexican wolf. And how do we know this? How do we know that wolves are important to the ecosystem? How many people have heard of Yellowstone? Have any of you gotten to go there? Raise your hand if you've been there. <gasps> Way cool. I used to work there. I worked on the wolf project there, and it was awesome. So if you guys haven't gotten a chance, go. And if you had had the chance but haven't gotten to see wolves, go again, because they're very cool. Well, Yellowstone, as you guys know, is the first national park of its kind in history. There had ever, never been a national park before. And it is this iconic place that we think of beautiful landscapes and waterfalls and all these just amazing vistas, right? But we also think of the really cool wildlife that's there. Bears, eagles, bison, and of course the cute foxes. I had to throw in one canid, right? But now, what do most people think about when they think about animals in Yellowstone? Bears. 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 Okay, what's second? <laughs> bison. All right, I am biased because I think of wolves first. <laughs> but you guys are right, bison and bears and wolves. Because in 1995, they introduced, reintroduced wolves back into Yellowstone. Wolves had been missing from the landscape in Yellowstone for, gosh, almost 70 years. This was actually, actually the pack I researched. Um, this is the alpha female here. Her name was Silver. So we named the pack after her, the Silver Pack. And what's amazing, in 1995, wolves were reintroduced and people from all over the world flocked to Montana and Idaho and Wyoming to come see these wolves. According to the Audubon Society, people spent over $35 million in ecotourism just to come see wolves, to be in the same place that they are, to maybe catch a glimpse and hear them howl. And that's money spent in hotel reservations, um, getting tour guides, shopping, um, all that different stuff, buying binoculars. So $35 million was poured into that economy around Yellowstone National Park just so people could come maybe get a glimpse of wolves. But people weren't always so excited to see wolves. Unfortunately, in the late 1800s and the early 1900s, people thought that wolves and bears and mountain lions, they didn't want them anymore. They were scared of them. They didn't know that they were important to the ecosystem back then. Actually, they thought that no wolves meant hunter's paradise. If any of you guys have read Aldo Leopold's Thinking Like a Mountain, it's a great story about somebody who used to not like wolves and used to hunt them. And then he quickly realized in the 1920s, after he had unfortunately shot a wolf, that what he was doing was not right. And he could see the ecosystem changing back then. He was one of the first people that noticed how important wolves were to the ecosystem. And because of that, because of that extermination program that was launched, we lost almost all the wolves. The last wolf in Yellowstone, we actually completely wiped the entire park out and the surrounding area. The last wolf was seen in the 30s. So like I said, Yellowstone was devoid of wolves for almost 70 years. No wolves in the park at all. And very little bear and definitely no mountain lions and, and other predators. So they really did a job. But that was a problem because Yellowstone needed its wolves, it needed its predators because there's this really fine balance. This is a study that was done in the 1920s with snowshoe hares and lynx. And it basically what it says is that when the two populations are 
working, they're working in tandem with each other. They balance each other. Um, and unfortunately, people didn't know that back then. They thought that wolves just decimated the prey population, that they wiped out deer and elk, and then if they were there, then we wouldn't have any deer and elk to hunt. But that's not true. So you guys see the red is the, the snowshoe hare population. And as it goes up, the lynx population goes up. Because the lynx are like, yay, I have food. I can feed my kittens. My kittens will survive. And my kittens will survive and have more kittens because there's a lot of food. Well, when the lynx population got too high because they had so many kittens, the hair, snowshoe hare population started to go down because they were, too many of them were getting eaten, right? Well, as they go down, so do the lynx population. Because now the lynx are like, oh, my kittens are starving. There's no snowshoe hares. I can't survive. I don't have as many kittens. Well, once they go down, the snowshoe hare is like, yay, I can have babies and they survive and now my population's gonna skyrocket again. And you see how that cycle happens. And now the lynx are like, great, now I can have more kittens again. And they balance each other. And nowhere over this po population do you ever see anybody getting crazier out of control or decimating the deer, the snowshoe hare population. Because one can't survive without the other in a way. Because when the, the other thing is when the snowshoe hare population gets too high, there's not as much food for the snowshoe hare population either, right? Because there's so many of them. Well, crazy enough, the same thing happened with elk, which is the main food source of gray wolves in Yellowstone. So as you guys can see right here, this is 1929, and we have a nice steady population. And all of a sudden, we shoot the last wolf. Now, the population still goes down for a while. Can you guys think of why, even though there's no predators? What did we not regulate back in the day? Disease. Well, disease is a good one. But what about us? What did we not regulate about ourselves? Hunting. Very good, hunting, somebody said it. So we didn't regulate hunting, and we overhunted the area. Well, around the 60s, we, also, we put into practice hunting rules and regulations, and then we also got grocery stores. So we didn't have to hunt any mu very much anymore, right? Because it was much easier just to go to the grocery store and get some frozen meat and put it in our freezer, and then I don't have to gut it and be gross and covered in stuff and get by bit by mosquitoes out while I'm hunting. So much more convenient. So once grocery stores and hunting regulations went into place, the elk were like, woohoo, oh, woohoo, I'm gonna go way up, woohoo. And then wolves were reintroduced. Because there's nothing there to keep them in check. No people, no predators, nothing. And then wolves were reintroduced. They hit some fires here and some disease that was mentioned earlier, but it still wasn't enough to keep them in the check of the amount of elk that the park supports, which is right here, right? But once wolves were introduced, they started to go back down to a healthy carrying capacity. And I feel bad, this is 2003, this ends. So we actually have another 10 years after this that I wish I could show you, but I don't have the new one. But it basically starts to look like this like the snowshoe hare lynx, where it kind of goes up and down. But without those wolves, boy, the elk population skyrocketed. It really did, and one of the bad things about that is we started to see disease go through the population. So this is an animal that is not doing so good. And that was, that's me, that's my job when I was there, was I was researching a wolf pack to see what they hunted and why. So after they took down an elk, and got their dinner and their family had all they needed to eat, we would actually go walk out to that carcass and take samples. We would look at the bone marrow to see how healthy they were. We would look at their teeth to see how old they were. Because did you guys know that our teeth are kind of like tree rings? If you cut into our tooth, you can see how old we are by counting the rings. So we were able to tell, this is a good example, this elk, which was one of the elk that my pack hunted, was so old she didn't have any teeth left. They were literally worn down and she could barely eat. And that's what wolves go after. They like the old and the diseased animals because it's much harder to hunt a big healthy buck with big antlers that's gonna kick you really hard, right? But if you're hunting the guy who's really sick and can't really run very much, you're not gonna get hurt. You're not gonna risk your pack and your family getting hurt. It's much easier to hunt those guys. So that's what we found out through this research is that the wolves were focusing on the sick and the weak. Well, what does that leave left in the herd? The strong, healthy ones. So as a hunter, I don't know if any of you guys hunt, but my family does, I can tell you that makes hunters much happier. Hunters don't like that hit, they don't want to hunt the sick and 
gross ones, that's not what they want to feed their family. They want to feed their family the healthy ones. And also on top of it, the healthy ones are the ones that get to go on and spread their genes. They're the ones that survive and have puppies. So ultimately wolves are helping the elk herd be stronger and healthier by removing those sick and weak ones. Well, what's interesting is something else was happening in the park too. We, we knew the elk population was skyrocketing. It doubled. If you looked at that, that um, chart I showed you, it almost doubled what the carrying capacity of the park was. And carrying capacity just means how much food and how many resources the park, can, how many animals it can sustain on those resources and that food. Well, this was before the wolves were reintroduced. And it was actually a plant biologist who discovered this. Who knew? The plant biologist was in the park studying different plants, trees, bushes, grasses, and he noticed that some of the plants that he hadn't seen in a really long time were starting to come back. And he couldn't figure out why. So he started, I mean, he had every theory. Maybe it's climate change is affecting it. Maybe there was a disease that went through that was affecting the plants, um, and now it's gone. And everything kept bringing him back to 1995. What did I tell you guys happened in 1995? The wolves came back. And so he couldn't figure out the connection until he realized the elk were overpopulated and the wolves were starting to bring those animals back down to a healthy level. And because they were at a healthy level, they weren't overeating everything. And so some of those plants could actually come back. Because when the wolves weren't there and the numbers went up, they were eating, I mean, everything down to the dirt. Elk were eating everything, and if a tree fell, there was no new saplings to replace it because the elk had just eaten it. So the tree started to go away. And what loves trees? Beavers. Beavers love trees, right? Well, when the wolves came back, the tree started to come back. And then the beaver came back. And the beaver made his beautiful dams out of those trees, and he made these gorgeous pools of still water. Well, amphibians and fish love those still pools to lay their eggs in. So they started to see different frog species come back and different endangered species of fish like the steelhead trout came back. And along the rivers, there were some really cool plants, some big bushes that came back that were great sources of food for butterfly and songbirds. But those had been eaten down before to nothing. But now they're coming back all these different animals were coming back and the park was becoming diverse and they were seeing animals and birds and butterflies that they hadn't seen in decades coming back to the park. So how cool is it that everything is so connected, right? One of the other things that they noticed, not only did the wolves affect how high the elk population was and when they brought it back to that level so it didn't skyrocket, but they also changed the elk's behavior. So before, the elk kind of got a little lazy. They didn't have to run away from any predators, right? So they would just sit there and they would eat everything down to the dirt and they would take a step and they would eat it down to the dirt because they didn't have to look around, they didn't have to move because there were no wolves there, right? But once the wolves came back, they would eat a little bit and move. Eat a li little bit and move so they weren't sitting targets. How many of you guys are gardeners? Hey, cool. Is, is pruning good for your plants? Pruning is really good for your plants. Is cutting them off at the base of the stem good for your plants? No. no. So the elk went back to what they were supposed to be doing by pruning the plants versus decimating them. So not only did they change the elk numbers, but they also changed their behavior back to a more natural one, and it helped the plants in that way as well. But even knowing how awesome that is, we still have people that don't love wolves, that are overhunting them, that don't want them in their backyard, because they're scared of them. But people and wolves can coexist. And that is one of the coolest things about science is we've got some scientists out there that are creating some really neat ways to coexist. But unfortunately, wolves and coyotes often get blamed for depredation of livestock. According to the USDA, less than 1% of all cattle losses and all livestock losses can be attributed to wolves. Less than 1%. And this is including things like lightning, disease, weather, um, injuries while they're out grazing, um, complications during birth, all of that, and other predators in there, all of those wolves are less than 1%. Now, for that rancher who does get hit, it's a big deal. 
And so, because of that, scientists have come up with some really cool ways to coexist and be able to have good husbandry practices for your animals so that you can live with wolves and other carnivores. You don't have to read all this because it's a lot, but this is just an example of some of the, the things that are out there. Some are old and really well tested, and some are new that science are, scientists are being creative about designing new ways to coexist. So for example, the top one, fladry. It's a really weir weird word, and all it means is waving flags. So if you guys have ever seen fences around goats and sheep that have flags on them that are waving in the wind, who knew that wolves were such big scaredy cats that a, flag, a waving flag would scare them off? But it works. It works. It works so much that when scientists tested it with some wolves in a pen before they put it into practice, they actually had this wolf pack where they divided their enclosure in half and they put fladry going across of it and a carcass on one side and the wolves on the other. Well, the wolves would not go over and get that carcass because they were so scared of that flagging, that fladry. And actually, the funny thing is, is there was a, a, a poor little omega wolf that was getting chased and picked on a ton. And one day she was getting chased and she accidentally ran across the flagging and the rest of the wolves were like, Arr! and she stopped. And when she was on the other side, she was like, huh. Food here, family here, food, family. They're not coming to get me. Hmm, I'm going to go eat this carcass all by myself. <laughs> and she had a good brunch. Now, when she went back with the pack, it wasn't so pretty because they were pretty jealous that she got all that herself. But that's how crazy that stuff is. It works that well. Um, and you can even electrify it just to add an extra zing, literally, um, to make sure it's even stronger and more effective. Guard dogs. So the flattery is something that's new. Guard dogs are something that's ancient. We have used, humans have used guard dogs for thousands of years to protect livestock. And what they do is they sit around the livestock, these huge 150 pound dogs are sitting around the, the livestock making sure that they stay safe. If they hear a predator coming, they will bark their heads off and scare that predator away because predators are big babies. They don't want to get hurt, right? Because if they get hurt, if they break a jaw, if they break a leg, that's it for them. They're not like us. They don't get to put their foot in a cast and go home and sit on the couch and eat bonbons while we watch the reruns of Grey's Anatomy while their leg heals. If they break their leg out in the wild, that's it. They're done. So they are not, they're very risk averse. They don't want to get hurt. So when they see that big giant Anatolian Shepherd guard dog, they're like, mm, see ya. I'm going to go the other way. And that's, what's crazy is it's something that we've used for thousands of years, but in the United States, we forgot about it. Because we eliminated all of those carnivores, we didn't really have to deal with carnivores as much anymore. And so it's something that kind of went out of practice. So now, facilities like ours are trying to teach people, hey, this is a really cool, inexpensive way to protect your livestock. It doesn't hurt the wolves, and your livestock gets protected. Perfect. Range riders, fancy word for cowboy, um, is something also that we've kind of lost track of. Now, a lot of ranchers just let their cattle loose and they'll come back and find it a couple weeks, a couple months later. Whereas before, they used to have cowboys riding with their cattle, right? And the cowboys were there because they protect the livestock. Because again, wolves know we're dangerous. They're scared of us. And so if you have range riders hired to go with your cattle, they'll protect them. And what's cool is not only can just their presence protect them, but again, science comes in. Woohoo, science! We've developed radio collars that can go around the wolves' necks and it sends off a signal. It looks big, but it's, it's not. Wolves are, are, they can handle it. Sends out a signal. If the range rider has his telemetry equipment, he can tell where the wolves are. And if they're close, he can move his cattle. Or he can make some loud noises and yell to scare off the wolves. So there's ways that you can do it. And if you have livestock, small livestock like chickens or rabbits, you can secure your pens better. There's some really good ways out there. And then you can haze the animals. Most wolves are afraid of people, 99.99999%. Just like most animals are afraid of people, right? But, and I'm sure there's a few, one or two of you that might be guilty of this in here. We love to feed wildlife. We love it. We love to feed our raccoons because they're so cute. But what happens is when we feed wildlife, like raccoons or wolves, because we think we're doing a favor, but we're not. We're actually habituating them to people. We are removing that natural fear that they have of people that protects them. When they see a person, it may be me who's nice and loves them, 
or it could be the guy down the street who's kind of grouchy and has a sawed off shotgun in his house. So you've got to be careful about those animals and making sure that they don't get hurt. So don't feed the wildlife. And if you do see wildlife that's too habituated to people, you can haze it. And all that means is make noise, bang pots and pans, scare them off. If you have a paintball, this is the only time it's okay to shoot a wolf with a paintball gun is if it's getting too close to your house, right? Or a coyote or something else. You want to tell it, I am scared. You should be scared of me. I am dangerous for you. And you're doing it a favor. It may seem mean, but you're helping make sure it survives. And we want them to survive, right? And then there's thoughtful husbandry practices, bringing your animals in when they're about to give birth instead of letting them do it way out in the wilderness. Um, bring, your close and bring them closer to structures like barns where wolves will stay away from them. And reduce attractants. Don't leave your pet unattended. Um, not that wolves go after pets, but coyotes might. Jeez, hawks might, eagles might. So don't let your cat outside. Um, and don't feed the wildlife. Here's some examples. You've got an Anatolian Shepherd, and he cute? Look at that face. Face so cute. Uh, but he's protecting his goats. That's his family. He's, and he, like I said, is about 150, 160 pounds. That poor old wolf that's about 100 pounds, he's no match. So he's going to see that big old dog, and he's going to run away. Here's a wolf with a radio collar. Here's range riders and a herding dog. Look at that, double the trouble. No wolves gonna go next to them. And here's that fladry. I just wanna reiterate, wolves are such scaredy cats. They're so scared of people and something new that a little fla waving flag is gonna scare them away. They're not the big bad wolf that you see on TV. Oh, big bad wolf, look at that transition. So if they're this big scaredy cat and they're afraid of people and they don't hurt people, how do we get to here? How do we get to where we say, whenever we talk about wolves, that they're, big, that they're the big bad wolf, right? Especially is crazy to me because the original idea of wolves was something that, had, that came from respect. That wolves were revered in a lot of ancient cultures. A great example is Rome. I don't know if any of you guys have heard the story of Romulus and Remus, but they were two little kids that were abandoned by their mom and this wolf, this mother wolf, found them and nurtured them back to life. Not too far off, not that they're going to find human babies and nurture them back to life, but mother wolves are very nurturing and very caring of their young. And people saw that. So they made this story about it because they saw how family-oriented wolves were and how caring they were. And Romulus and Remus went on to go found Rome. And so in the Roman culture, wolves were awesome. They really loved them. If you look back at a lot of Native American stories. Wolves are revered for how smart they are, how loyal they were, how family oriented they were. It was something that we wanted to emulate. But unfortunately, we went from that to this. And there's a lot of reasons why. One is we went from hunters and gatherers who lived side by side with wolves to agriculturists who settled down and had herds of livestock and who had our crops and kind of started to come in become competition, come in competition with each other. Because every once in a while, a wolf would take livestock, right? So they started to see them not as good. And hunting for fun became a thing. And wolves are really tough to hunt because, again, they can hear you coming from a mile away and they take off. So it is very hard to hunt wolves. They're very afraid of people and very smart. The Black Plague played a big role, too. And I'll try and keep this light. But in, during the Black Plague, unfortunately, a lot of uh, losses happened and the towns took care of those losses by putting them outside of the town in a giant pile and unfortunately a lot of different animals came and scavenged on those and people saw and one of those was wolves and it's not because they wanted that it's because hey it's there we don't nothing goes to waste in nature and people started putting that image of of that in their minds associated with wolves and it became a bad thing not the wolf's fault and then, because it, it got so bad and the story started to turn bad, wolf bounties were set. And now it became a way to make a living. So I'm really going to not like wolves because that's going to help me deal with how many I'm killing and making a profit off of them. I want to get as many as I can so I can make money. And so that turned into just a huge cultural overhaul of how we look to wolves, how we see them. I mean, think of what you guys grow up with. 
Little Red Riding Hood, Three Little Pigs when you're, when you're kids, to when you're teenagers, you're watching werewolf movies. You've watched a werewolf movie, haven't you? What? Not one? Don't tell my parents, but I totally did when I was a teenager. And it was scary. And then when you're adults, there's movies like The Grey that just came out with Liam Neeson a couple years ago. Any of you guys see it? It's okay, you can admit it. Hey, that's awesome. Don't see it. Sorry, Liam Neeson, if you're watching this. Um, but it's a horrible movie that portrays nothing accurate about wolf behavior. It's about these guys who crash in a mountain and all of a sudden this wolf pack's after them. That's not what happens. And as a biologist, I'm sitting there screaming at the TV and my husband's like, oh, I can't watch this movie with you. <laughs> but it's, it's amazing how movies like that really affect our culture. A good example is my brother-in-law came to the center one day to help me fix some fencing because he's a welder. He's awesome. And he I had just gotten done with a news interview for a TV station. He said, oh, what were you getting interviewed about? I said, well, there's this new movie out called The Grey with Liam Neeson, and it's really set back wolf conservation a ton. And he goes, why? I said, well, it portrays wolves really negatively. And he goes, man, you guys are such bunny huggers. You go watch that TV show, and you think everybody thinks it's real, right? That's not the case. It's not like we all go see Transformers and go home and think our toasters are going to turn into evil robots and get us, right? He said, people are smart enough to know that that's not going to happen, that wolves aren't really like that. Well, I give it to Scott. He didn't have to tell me, but a couple of months later, he was sitting at a bar with some of his friends, and one of them slid a movie across the table and said, hey, man, you've got to watch this movie. It's called The Gray. I had no idea wolves were like this. <laughs> and Scott told me he was wrong, and people sometimes believe what they see on TV, just a little too much, right? And even new movies. How many of you guys have seen Frozen? Really, that's it? I, mean, I think I've seen Frozen about 430 times because my six-year-old, it's her favorite movie in the whole world. Is there a bad wolf scene in it? Yes. Yeah. You guys remember when the wolves chase Anna? Wolves don't do that. That's not real, OK? So all of you guys know that. Even Beauty and the Beast that just came out, it has a bad wolf scene in it. Come on, Disney. Disney, if you're listening. Stop putting wolves as the bad scene, or the, as the bad guys. But it's amazing. This stuff gets into our brain, and it really changes how we see things. So what did, what did all this negativity do? How did it affect wolves? We almost lost all of them. We almost lost all of them. And actually, we did lose quite a few. A lot of subspecies of gray wolf went extinct. And two of the species that we work with, the red wolf and the Mexican wolf, they were on the brink. There was just a handful left. And luckily, the US government went out, found all the remaining red wolves and Mexican wolves, and saved them. They actually brought them into captivity and started a breeding program to reintroduce them. If they hadn't done that, if facilities like the Endangered Wolf Center hadn't existed in the 1960s and 70s, we would have lost those species too. <coughs> So I'm going to talk to you guys tonight about one of my favorite animals that we work with because you guys are in Missouri and it's actually it's one of our native wolves. We don't have it here anymore, but maybe someday we could. So I'm going to talk to you guys about the American red wolf. This is the most endangered wolf in the entire world. It's actually one of the most endangered mammals in the entire world. And it is solely native to United States, meaning it's actually the only large carnivore that is species that is solely native to United States. For example, mountain lions cross the Canadian border and the Mexico border. Black bears and grizzlies cross the borders, right? Other different species lynx cross the border, but red wolves are only native to United States. You cannot find them in any other country. So they are our wolf. How often do you guys hear conservation stories where we say, hey man, Kenya, you've got to save your elephants. China, you've got to save your pandas. <coughs> Tanzania, how can you let your rhinos get hunted to extinction? And we're mad, right? But yet here in our own backyard, we're about to lose our true American wolf. Give you some cool fun facts about it, because I know the kids really love all this fun stuff about the wolves. They have about five pups per litter. They're only about, red wolves are only about 55 to 80 pounds, so they're a small wolf. Bigger than coyotes though, right? Coyotes are only about 20 to 25 pounds. 
They howl. They have body language to talk to each other. Their ears go up. They're really excited. They're mad. Their ears go back. And they can read all that language. They scent mark. That means they pee. <laughs> their breeding season is only once a year. So that is very different than dogs and some other species of canid. They can only breed one time a year. So basically for three days, they can, have, they can get pregnant and have, uh, have puppies. And their puppies come about 60 to 63 days later. And then the puppies, they leave the nest and go off to college around two years old. <laughs> For red wolves, 70%, the only place that you can find red wolves now is in North Carolina. They were actually extinct in the wild for several decades while we started that breeding program in captivity and then we reintroduced them. They were one of the first animals ever of its kind to be reintroduced. But now the only place in the entire southeastern United States that you can find them is in North Carolina and they've found that the majority of their diet is white-tailed deer. Do we have any white-tailed deer here? Yeah. Do we have maybe too many white-tailed deer here? I can tell you my mom tells me all the time, she goes, can you just release a red wolf in my backyard because the deer keep eating all my flowers. <laughs> but one of the other things they found is they eat a lot of small carnivores and small invasive animals. So they eat raccoons, which can get overpopulated. They eat nutria, which is this weird rat looking thing that's from South America that somehow got up here. Um, and it's tearing up our different plant species because nothing here naturally eats it. They also eat feral hogs. I used to work on a mountain lion project in California where we would capture and collar mountain lions. And the, the collars helped us find where they, their diet, their food that they just took down for the night was. And we would go out, and one of the things that they would eat were feral, were feral hogs. Now, I don't know if you guys know this, but feral hogs have moved into Missouri and they are just tearing apart a lot of areas. And when they tear it apart and they dig and they root, they're killing the plants, the plants that provide food for butterflies and Birds and all those other animals that we talked about in Yellowstone are all getting decimated by the feral hogs. And we've tried to control them, and we can't do it. We're just not good enough. So maybe wolves could do that someday. People often call us and say, hey, guys, I think one of your wolves got loose. <laughs> if you could, just go count them again real quick, one more time. Well, I tell you, make sure that the keepers make sure every day that they, all the animals are there, and they're healthy and safe and doing good, so they didn't get out. But we do have some canids here. Who knows what canids we have? Coyote. I heard it. Yeah, coyote. And fox. We have red fox and gray fox, right? So you guys can see, here's the red wolf. This is a little inaccurate. The red wolf will be a little bit bigger. And then you've got your gray wolf. And then you've got your little coyote and your little red fox. So coyotes are about half the size, actually less than half the size of a, of a red wolf. We have some of our red wolves that get up to about 70, 75 pounds. And most of the coyotes that are around the area are around 20, 25 pounds. So they fill a very different niche in the ecosystem. If you guys ever see tracks in your backyard, they're probably not a wolf. They're probably a domestic dog. You know how you can tell if it's a domestic dog or a wolf, if it's a really big track? Have any of you guys taken your dog for a walk? Do they walk in a straight line? No. What do they do? They walk around and they sniff this. And then they're over here and they're, they're sniffing you. And then they're over here and they're sniffing this. Because they can do that, right? They can expend a whole bunch of energy investigating everything because they know you're going to feed them when you get home. <laughs> and if you don't, they will lick you to death. <laughs> so wolves don't have that opportunity. They don't have that luxury to just smell and investigate anything they want to. They can't waste that energy. So when they get up and move, they are on a mission. So they have a straight line. And you can tell their tracks go in a straight line. They're, they're patrolling their territory, they're making sure it's safe, they're out you know, trying to find a weak, sick, old deer, and that's what they do. And if it doesn't have claw marks on it, like this, and it's really big, what is it? Well, if it doesn't have claw marks, not a dog. A cat, what kind of cat if it's really big? Mountain lion, yep, we have pumas here. They're starting to come back into Missouri, very rarely, but they are starting to come back. If it's really tiny, teeny, and it doesn't have claw marks, it's a, it's a cat. It's a household cat. So why do we have coyotes? So many coyotes here. Did you guys know that coyotes aren't native to Missouri? 
It's an invasive species. I love coyotes, but I love them where they're native. And they're not native here. They moved in because all the wolves were decimated in this area and all throughout the United States and coyotes went, woohoo, we're gonna take everything over. And the reason that worked is because coyotes, they're not shy. They don't mind going into your dumpster and getting food. They're opportunistic. And they can breed a ton. And so because of all that, they were able to take over where wolves couldn't. Wolves are shy. Wolves don't breed as often. Wolves are not as opportunistic, opportunistic around people. They want to stay away from them. And coyotes can sustain, a, a, they can live on a very small piece of land. So for example, if you have a 100 square mile piece of property, don't we all wish we had a 100 square mile piece of property? <laughs> um, if we had that, you'd have dozens of coyotes on it. Dozens. That same piece of property would only sustain one wolf pack, five animals. So would you rather have 40, 50 coyotes or five or six wolves that are helping reduce those deer that are eating all your begonias? Coyotes don't take the deer down. So what does this mean for the red wolf? Our true American wolf, right? Well, they were declared endangered in 1967. As I told you, the government went out and tried to find all the last remaining red wolves are in the wild. And of all the animals they caught, which was about 400 animals, only 14 of them were pure red wolf. What do you think the other animals were? Mixed, I heard it. With what do you think? Dog. Dog and coyote. So when species, and it doesn't matter if it's wolf or it's polar bear, actually we're seeing this with polar bears in, in the Arctic right now. They're, they're losing a lot of their territory because of climate change and they're starting to come down and they're breeding with grizzly bears because their populations are declining and that's all they can find. And that happened with red wolves. They couldn't find any more because they'd all been shot. And so they saw this little brown coyote running around. Well, I guess that'll do. <laughs> because we had, all, every animal has that instinct to make sure that our species goes on, right? Red wolves are the same way. But of those 400 that were left, only 14 were pure. And so those 14 were brought into captivity and a, a breeding program was started to try and save the red wolf. So this is where gray wolves used to be. The Mexican wolf used, subspecies used to be down here. And you have your northern gray wolves up here. And this gray area right here is where red wolves were. They didn't overlap with, with gray wolves at all. They had their own unique niche. So now do you guys see why I say they're, they're only an American species? They never cross the border either way. And this is a little bit of a bigger view of the historic range of red wolves, as you guys can see. Yay, there's Missouri, woohoo! Woo <laughs> Look, St. Louis is like, we love our red wolves. They really liked us there. But now the only place that you can find red wolves is in North Carolina, right on the coast, which is not good because they're losing a lot of their coast there to rising waters, unfortunately. Just to put in perspective, we talked about coyotes earlier and how I told you they're invasive and nobody believes me because coyotes have been around forever and I swear to God they're native. They're not. This is where, before Europeans got here, where coyotes used to be native to. This is where they are now. Again, I love coyotes. They're awesome. And they're really important for the ecosystem where they're native. So in 1987, Red wolves were released in North Carolina, and this is something we as Americans should be so proud of. This was the first reintroduction of its kind ever in human history ever. How awesome is that? That we had the forward thought of saying, you know what, we're going to save all the wolves that are left out in the wild, we're going to start a breeding program, and then we're going to get them back out into the wild. So this happened in 1987, and with this, over the last 30 years, this is the 30th anniversary, how awesome is that? Over the last 30 years, the scientists with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service have just continually broke ground on new techniques to save endangered species. They've figured out how to release the animals so that they succeed out in the wild. They've figured out how to monitor the animals so that they stay safe. They have, because the technology, like the collars and all that stuff, now we're used to it, but back then it was new. They figured out how to foster pups from the captive program and into the wild, and I'm going to talk about that in a little bit because that's really cool. 
And there's, there's so many other different things that they've done that are awesome. But today, there's only about 200 animals in captivity and less than 40 in the wild. So from that release program in the 40s, or in the, in the 1987, we were doing good for quite a while. The numbers were going up, everything was working. We actually got up to about 150 animals in the wild in 2013 or so. Everything was doing great. They weren't getting, they, we weren't losing animals, the animals were breeding, they were, they were doing what they needed to do. But then all of a sudden in the last few years, the population has skyrocketed. This critically endangered, federally protected endangered species population plummeted. I know, right? Why? Because of misinformation. And we, that is one of the things that we do at the Endangered Wolf Center is we talk about all those myths that are out there. Everybody thinks wolves are going to eat your grandma. <laughs> Thanks, little Red Riding Hood. That is not true. Did you guys know that red wolves and Mexican wolves that we work with have never hurt a human in recorded history? But everybody thinks they're going to get grandma. And that is not true. They're going to decimate my livestock. Does anybody remember how much livestock losses are due to wolves? 1%. Less than. Less than 1%. Good job. Everybody thinks they're going to decimate the deer population. They're going to make the deer population go down to a normal, natural level, right? And if the deer population goes too low, what's going to happen to the wolves? They go down too, right? Because that's their food source. And as soon as they go down, the deer are like, woohoo, I can have babies. And they'll go back up and the wolves will go back up. But everybody thinks that that's, what's, that wolf, that's what wolves are all about. And in the captive program, even the zoo world that I work in, we have our own fake news. People think that wolves can't be reintroduced into the southeastern United States. There's not enough space left. That they're too hard to manage in captivity. They're not. They stay away from people. It's awesome. They're really easy to manage. Just give them a, lot, a big space and food and they take care of each other. That's what they do. Then, one of the other myths that have surrounded wolf, the red wolf is that they're a hybrid. People think they're a hybrid with, with coyotes and, and red wolves or gray wolves. And unfortunately, a paper came out last summer that if you only read the newspaper articles on it, you would think that the science just said that that's what was true, that they are hybrids. Well, as we all know, fake news is pretty prevalent, right? And it doesn't matter if it's science, an endangered species, it still infiltrates. Well, unfortunately, those journalists got it wrong. They never talked to the author and they never really read the paper. I'm a scientist and when I read geneticist papers, my brain shuts down. It is very hard to understand because they speak in geneticist language and it's very tough to understand. But when you read the paper, you realize that that's not what the, the author was saying. And I actually got to talk to the lead author, a very cool lady. Her name is Bridget Van Holt. And she basically said, they got it wrong. What I was trying to say in my paper is that the red wolf is an admixture of gray wolf and coyote from 50,000 years ago. 50,000 years ago. I hate to break it to you guys, but we're an admixture too. Do you guys know with what? Indians. What? Indians. Nope, way further back than that. Vikings. I like fire. Amen. 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 See, Neanderthals, right? right? We are a hybrid. Who knew? Humans are hybrids. Most animals are. That's how evolution works. Sometimes animals get together and they make a, a new animal and over time it evolves into its own thing. And that's what happened with the red wolf. And if 50,000 years kicking out all other canids and growing into your own niche and becoming your own, own type of animal doesn't constitute a species, I don't know what does. Because you guys remember that map, right? The southeastern United States had no other species of canid there. Just the red wolf. Because over 50,000 years, it evolved into its own cool species. But misinformation, it's out there. And then one of the things I keep hearing is that the Fish and Wildlife Service has given up on the Red Wolf program. We're not going to save it. 
Well, that's not true, but the reason that came into account, and the reason I'm gonna tell you guys this story is I want you to know how important what you guys are doing right now is and how you guys can save an endangered species. A few years ago, some really well-meaning NGOs wanted to stop night hunting of coyotes in the Red Wolf recovery area, because at night, it's really hard to see. And red wolves were being mistaken for coyotes, and we were losing a lot of them. Well, the judge took it a step further and shut down all coyote hunting. And that made the locals very upset. They did not want somebody coming in and telling them what they can and cannot do on their property. And so really, just a few individuals launched a huge anti-wolf campaign. And they went around door to door and they said, hey, did you guys know that wolves are going to eat your grandma? <laughs> did you guys know that they're decimating the deer population? You're not going to have any deer to hunt anymore. Hey, did you guys know if we shut down the Red Wolf program, all that money that's going to save them could go to building your schools and your streets? I can tell you in 30 years, it's cost each of you 10 cents to help save the Red Wolf. It's not an expensive program. But nobody knew. In this area, there hadn't really been an, an extensive education campaign. So when these people came and told them that, they said, oh my God, we had no idea how dangerous wolves were. We have got to call our politicians and tell them to shut this program down. We don't want them in our backyard because we love grandma. <laughs> and unfortunately, the politicians listened. And so they pushed, North Carolina pushed Fish and Wildlife Service to review their program and see if they really should have it anymore. Well, North Carolina said, okay, or uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service said, okay, not only are we going to do that, but we're going to hire an independent outside organization to come do our review. So we're not biased. Wildlife Management Institute came in, did a review. They talked to everybody, all the different stakeholders, the landowners, the Fish and Wildlife Service, the politicians. They talked to everybody. They looked at the history of the program, all the science that was out there about red wolves. And they came back and they said, you know what? Not only should this program continue, but we should find some more places to release red wolves so we can save them. But they did say Fish and Wildlife Service to change some of their management techniques and work with the communities better. That's not a bad thing. We can always figure out ways to work better with each other. Well, that was not what North Carolina wanted to hear. They were not happy. They were hoping WMI was going to say you should shut down the program. So North Carolina just said, you know what? We're done. We want you to shut down the program. We're just asking you to do it. No more reviews. We want you to shut down the program. Fish and Wildlife Service responded and said, okay, we'll do our own internal review and figure out if, if this program can succeed. With all the different things that have happened, let's find out if we can save this wolf. Well, for a year and a half, we sat there biting our nails because we weren't sure what was going to happen while they were doing their review. It took them a year and a half to go through all of that. And they came back last fall and said, we are dedicated to saving the American red wolf. It is a true species based on the science that's out there. And we are going to make sure that it gets back to our, our lands and keeps our, our American landscape healthy. And not only are we going to get them back, but we want to find new places to reintroduce them so that we can make more ecosystems healthy and intact. And we want to make sure the captive population, like what we work with, stays safe so that we can reintroduce more animals in the future and get those numbers up high and healthy. <laughs> so we know we want to find new spaces for red wolves to live in, right? So how do we go from the big bad wolf being a source of fear to the American red wolf being a source of pride. Mm -hmm. Well, we're helping with that. We're trying really hard. We're working with what's called the Species Survival Plan, which is a group of organizations around the US. And we've come together and we've designed education techniques because, boy, did we learn our lesson. We've got to get out there and talk about how cool wolves are and that they're not scary. And Little Red Riding Hood, she might have lied. And we're focusing on the local community's interest. We're talking about how wolves actually benefit us. Did anybody realize that wolves benefit us? Not just the ecosystem. Remember how I talked about wolves and wanting to get the sick out of the ecosystem or out of the deer population because that's much easier to hunt? Well, they reduce the disease that goes from your wild ungulates like your deer to your livestock. That's awesome. What's a disease that we have going through our deer right now in, in Missouri? 
chronic wasting disease, and it's bad, guys. That's a scary disease. And if we had wolves here, we could help reduce that disease spreading through the deer population so that when people go out to hunt a deer, they're not getting one that's sick, and they're not risking their family's lives by eating that deer. We need wolves back. They help us. They benefit us. They bring that deer population back down to a healthy level that stays pretty even across the board, right? And that reduces the competition of deer with your livestock that are grazing. Your livestock need food too, right? I like my cheeseburgers. I want the livestock to keep going and do, and do well. And I hate to say it, but we've actually designed a marketing campaign. Can you guys believe an endangered species needs a marketing campaign? But the wolf does. The wolf definitely does. And we're talking to people about how this is your American species. Like I said earlier, people just don't realize that. Now you guys know. And we've designed some material that's education material that's free for anybody to use. The reason I'm telling you guys all this is because I need you guys to see what goes into saving endangered species. Whether it's a California condor or a wolf or a rhino, there's a lot of people working behind the scenes to try and help save these animals. And it takes all sorts of inventive and creative ways. We partner with people to, to do author readings, and, and we actually were at the St. Louis Science Center and did a film showing. We do amazing research. Last year, we fostered the first ever Mexican wolves that were born at our facility that were just a few days old. Two of them fit in my hand. Teeny tiny babies, They're, they were blind and deaf, they were so young, I don't know if you guys know that, but all pups that are born are blind and deaf until about 11 days old. They rely on scent and heat for mom. And we fostered them out into the wild. We took pups born at our center. We flew them all the way down to Arizona. We hiked up the side of a mountain, as you can see there. And boy, I was tired. It was 8,000 feet elevation, and I was not used to it. You can see the little pups are right there in my bag. And we walked up to a wild wolf den who had puppies in it. And we could tell, we knew that mom had puppies because she started to do what's called localizing. We could tell from her collar that sent signals down on where she was located that she started to stay in one spot. And wolves don't do that. They only have dens when they have puppies. Otherwise, they are out and moving around their territory all year long. So we could tell she had a den, which means she had puppies. We found her den, and we put our puppies into her puppy, into her litter, made them all smell like each other. We rubbed their fur on each other. We took some of the dirt from the den and rubbed it on each other. We might have made them pee on each other. <laughs> but we really wanted them to all smell alike, right? So mom couldn't tell the difference. And then we got out. We were only there for a few minutes, and then we got out. Mama took them. So that was in April and May. And we found out last fall in October, they put little microchips, just like you do your dog and the wolves and the puppies when they were little, and they actually got hands-on one of those puppies in October. And when the other packs, because we did it in three different packs, um, two from our center, one from a facility in Chicago, so there's three different foster attempts, one of the other packs, they got a picture of the puppies. And they could tell because they knew how many puppies were in the litter and mom and dad, and they got all of them in a shot. It worked. Mom and dad are such good parents that they took on those those pups, just like we would, right? If we had a baby in our front door, we're not going to kick it out. We're going to take it in and take care of it. And that's what they did. They adopted them. And that's groundbreaking. And that was with Mexican wolves. But that, we were able to do that because the Red Wolf program had, did it first. And we were able to learn from them and do it with a whole different species. That's their new home. Isn't it beautiful? We did research on collars. And I'm going to play so you guys can take a break. You don't want to hear it from me anymore. For you guys who used to watch Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom, it's back. They have a new series. And they came and filmed at our center, which how perfect is that, since Marlon started our center. And uh, do I press play? I'm, I'll break the computer if I look at it. So he's going to get it to press play for me. And I'll show you the collars that we studied and how cool it is. A deer, correct? Mm -hmm. So do you take a deer to where the wolves are, a dead deer? And yeah, so she's asking us what we feed our animals. We do feed them deer that have been hit by cars. 
it's a great way, nothing goes to waste, right? So the Department of Transportation, bring, Department of Transportation brings us deer and also hunters. We love our hunters. They donate deer to us all the time. So we get to, they get to practice eating native prey. So the packway. The packway, yep. I just want you guys to get to see cute puppies. These are pups at our center. Although still in charge, a mother wolf gets help from all her fellow pack mates after her pups are born. The vulnerable new pack members need as much guidance as they can get to learn how to survive successfully in the wild. After about two months of gestation, a mother wolf gives birth to a litter of around four to six pups. Believe it or not, for the first 11 days, they're completely blind. They're actually quite helpless, so they use sense of heat and sense of smell to feel around their environment and communicate with their parents. The pups remain in the den with mom for the first four to five weeks until they're ready to venture out and meet their pack family. Because they're so vulnerable and the hope is to release them into the wild, the Endangered Wolf Center gives them a boost to ensure their health is the best it can be. That was so amazing. I just gotta help the vet and the staff here to do the vet checks for all three endangered Mexican wolf pups. The little girl. We were able to give them different types of shots to keep them in good health and give them their flea and tick medication. We were able to check their teeth, their ears, their eyes. They are looking so healthy. So hopefully one day these pups will be released back out into the wild. There you go. Even after they're released, scientists still have more questions. Biologist Regina Mozadi gave me the latest details on how scientists are using creativity to keep tabs on the pups in the wild. In Mexican wolves, the pups in the wild aren't surviving very well, and the biologists on the ground can't find out why, because trying to find a tiny little puppy in 7,000 square miles is really tough. Yeah, I can imagine. So what do you do? The biologists have come up with a very creative way of designing collars that grow with the puppy. Brilliant. And the little stitches that are there, they actually will expand as the puppies expand and, and pop open. And we were able to test this on our litter last year that we had born here. We had three puppies, and so far, it's still on them a year and something later, and is working great. One of the things people don't think about, scientists have to be creative too, and the design in this collar is something that could actually help save endangered species. That's so cool. From completely helpless pups when born to becoming an integral adult member of the pack, wolves practice a family structure that teaches both etiquette and survival at the same time. Are they ever? <laughs> Are they ever? So that, that collar basically is expanding with them and we had to test at our center before we put it on pups in the wild, right? Because if it didn't work, those biologists, when they see those puppies that are a few weeks old, they're never going to see them again. It's going, to be a, it's going to be really hard to see them when they're older. So they need to make sure that those collars are safe and work. So that's some of the cool groundbreaking research that we're helping with. This year we did the first ever artificial insemination using frozen semen. And the reason that's important is I told you there was only just a handful of Mexican wolves left, right? And we need all the genetics we can to make sure that population stays healthy. And so for the last 30 years, we've been collecting those samples from the males and freezing them. So there's animals that have died or that never had puppies that we can bring back and have that female have the, the pups from those guys and bring those genetics back, making sure that endangered species population stays healthy. And that's awesome. And that happened this year. And we had this guy born. His name's Nash, and he's awesome. We did his health check and he was very healthy. And he was from semen that was frozen for years. And it worked. It worked. That made international headlines. We were in the London Guardian. How cool is that? There's other research that we're doing. So this is all research that can help all different type of wolf species. We're working with Mizzou. Go Tigers. Anybody else? <laughs> Woohoo. Everybody's like slew and wash you fans here, aren't you guys? Go Tigers. But we're working on finding out where in the southeastern United States red wolves can live. We know Fish and Wildlife Service needs that research done, so we're doing it. That's what our center does. We, we take science to the next level. And we're collaborating. Collaborating, collaborating, collaborating. If you've not heard that or seen that on this slide, that is key 
to our success. We work with some amazing institutions, the St. Louis Zoo, Washington University, the Science Center. We even work with the St. Louis Poetry Center, which is just awesome. Poetry is the best. And thinking outside the box and collaborating with all these institutions helps us get the word out. One of my favorite recent collaborations is with Arkansas State University. They're the home of the Red Wolves. Their mascot are Red Wolves. And I think quite a few of their, science, their students probably think that's just an imaginary mythical creature. So the guys at Arkansas State are working on changing that. They're teaching them how this mascot is a really cool endangered species that they can help save. And we actually collaborated with them to open up the first ever museum for all red wolf specimens. This can help with just a ton of different research in the future. Very exciting. Wolves up. That's their sign for red wolves. Wolves up. So, do you guys think we can save wolves? Yes. Woohoo! I do too. <laughs> and remember how I told you in North Carolina? It was just a handful of people that changed things in the negative direction. Imagine what all of you guys could do in the positive direction. So your job is to go home and you're going to go tell your friends that your grandma is safe, right? Yeah. Wolves are not going to eat your grandma. I was because I research wolves way too much. Blah, exactly. So you guys go tell people that wolves actually benefit us. They help reduce disease. They get rid of those horrible feral hogs. They save the ecosystem. That is your job now. You guys are ambassadors. You guys can help save wolves. We're a team. So thank you guys for coming out. I appreciate it. Do you guys have questions? Yeah. Don't touch them, you don't talk to them, but all this hands on. The With the puppies, good question. Good, she's smart. She said you don't talk, you said you don't pet them or talk to them or habituate them, but you're holding the puppies. Well, we do have to go in and give the puppies their vaccinations. Our adult wolves, just like your dogs at home, have to get yearly vaccinations. When we go in and catch our wolves, we go into their enclosure and we start to surround them. What do you guys think the wolves do? Run away. They run away from us, and they run into some small areas. And when they go in those small areas, when we get close to them, they go, oh, don't look at me. And that's how scared they are of people. And so we hold them down with some tools really quickly. The vet gives them their shots, and then we let them go. And it's kind of scary, but it's five minutes of scariness to ensure that when they go out into the wild and they see those crazy two-legged two -legged things walking around, that they stay away from them. It's just like when you guys went to the doctor the first time, you're probably like, Doctor's okay, no big deal. And then you got your shots, and you're like, I never want to go to the doctor again. So that's our goal with the pups. And we handle them for two seconds, and we get out. Yeah? Um, so on the slide that said tracks, it looks like um, the front paws are bigger than the back paws. Yep. So it helps them get traction when they're running. They need to be able to push themselves through that snow. And so their front paws are bigger than their back paws. Good eye. Species. No, gray wolves are not an invasive species. She asked if they're invasive species. They're not. Actually, gray wolves are endangered as well. We didn't talk about them. But we actually ha used to have over a million gray wolves in the United States. We now only have about 5,000. That's not a lot. We'll do two more questions. That way there's enough time for the Sure. Sure. So I'm going to take two more questions. And then before we're done, you guys can come up and see some pelts and skulls that we brought. These are animals that were at our center that died naturally. And we figured, you know what? People can't touch the wolves at our center. But maybe this is a way that those guys can live on and help teach about their species. So that's, that's what those are. Yeah. Um, do you just take care of wolves or do you take care of other animals? She asked if I just take care of wolves. I take care of foxes and painted dogs as well. So if you guys come out to our center, you can see them all. And I used to work with cheetahs and pumas and some other animals. Yep. Oh, wait, I think in the back. I think you asked a question. Sorry, you can come up and ask me afterwards, though. Yeah. Um, I was wondering what kind of degree you got in college. So she asked what degree I got. So for my undergraduate, I got an environmental science degree. And I went to Hawaii Pacific University. Aloha. Um, for my master's, I did a zoology degree. Um, and I went to Southern Illinois University. Go Salukis. Woohoo. Um, and then I started my PhD at Oregon State University in ecosystem e and ecology. But the job opened up at the center. And I loved the work that the center did so much that I left Oregon and came here and took this job. Tough decision, but the center's awesome.
All right, you guys come up and ask me questions up here afterwards. Thank you.